In this topic, we're going to look at cystic fibrosis and gene therapy. So by the end of this topic, you should be able to answer the questions, what is cystic fibrosis? What systems in the body are affected? What are the symptoms? What is the genotype of someone with cystic fibrosis? What are the different types of treatment? And then finally, what are the advantages and disadvantages of gene therapy to treat cystic fibrosis? Cystic fibrosis is an autosomal genetic disease, which means that it's not sex-linked. 70% of the cases are caused by a mutation on chromosome 7. It's caused by a mutant recessive allele, and the mutation is a Delta F508 mutation. The normal gene called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator CFTR gene, normally produces a protein of 1,480 amino acids. So this folds into a protein called the CFTR protein that actively transports chloride ions across the epithelial membranes, out of the epithelial cells. This allows for water to follow by osmosis. Now in this way, epithelial cells are kept moist. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a mutant recessive allele. It occurs because three DNA bases are missing. So have a look at the base sequences I'm explaining. So it's an example of a deletion mutation that results in a frame shift. This means that an amino acid phenylalanine is left out and the protein is either not made or cannot perform its function of transporting chloride ions across the epithelial membranes. So here you can see the normal CFTR protein and the mutant CFTR protein. On the left, the normal protein moves chloride ions outside of the cell so water can follow. What about the mutant CFTR protein? Can you see that it hasn't been folded into the correct structure? So it isn't properly inserted into the membrane. What about the chloride ions? They will not be able to flow through the protein, so water does not follow the chloride ions out of the cell. So this results in thicker mucus and very salty sweat. Here we have two genetic sequences of the antisense strands of DNA. One is of a person with cystic fibrosis, and the other is of a normal person. Have a look at these sequences and try and decide which sequence is for the normal person and which is for a person with cystic fibrosis. The bottom sequence represents a person who doesn't have cystic fibrosis and the top sequence represents a person who does have cystic fibrosis. Please make sure that you check this is the correct way around in your notes. Now cystic fibrosis affects the lungs and the respiratory system, the pancreas and the digestive system, and the sperm ducts in the reproductive system. In the lungs, there's mucus congestion. The epithelial membranes are dry, and the mucus they produce remains viscous and sticky. The mucus cannot be moved by cilia, and this mucus creates a breeding env ground environment for bacteria. Because the mucus cannot be moved out of the lungs, breathing difficulties result and there's less efficient gases exchange. Now in some cases the lungs may become scarred. The person will thus wheeze and cough to bring up phlegm. Furthermore, repeated chest infections such as pneumonia result. Accumulation of thick mucus blocks the pancreatic ducts. This prevents pancreatic enzymes reaching the duodenum. This will result in poor digestion. The proteases in the pancreatic juice begin to digest the pancreatic tissue and fibrous cysts develop. So that's where the name cystic fibrosis comes from. Accumulation of thick mucus blocks the sperm ducts in males. 
possibly leading to infertility. Can you remember why a person with cystic fibrosis will have salty sweat? This is because the chloride ions cannot move out of the epithelial cells, so water will not follow. Other symptoms include intestinal blockage, greasy stools, dehydration, and delayed growth in spite of a big appetite. So cystic fibrosis can be followed by sinusitis, where the sinuses, which produce mucus and keep the lining of the nose moist, become swollen. Bronchiectasis, a lung disease where the bronchial tubes are flabby and form pockets from the excess mucus. This becomes a place for bacteria to grow, and this leads to lung infections and can lead to serious illnesses. Pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung. Clubbing or enlargement of the fingertips or toes. Nasal polyps, which are growths in the nose. Pancreatitis, inflammation in the pancreas. Rectal prolapse, intestinal blockage and liver disease. Now I've already mentioned that cystic fibrosis is caused by a recessive allele. Let's have a look at what this means. If we represent the normal and recessive alleles by a capital R and lowercase r respectively, what will be the genotype of someone with cystic fibrosis? It'll be lowercase r, lowercase r. So he will have two delta F508 alleles. What about a person who does not have cystic fibrosis but is a carrier? What will his genotype be? It'll be capital R, small r. This means he has one normal allele and one delta F508 allele. And then a person without cystic fibrosis will be homozygous dominant, capital R, capital R. Now if two parents who are carriers have children, it's possible that they will have one child who is affected by the disease. So have a look at this diagram. Can you see the child with the genotype small r, small r, will have cystic fibrosis? So where there's a history of the disease in both families, the parents may choose to be genetically screened to see whether they carry the disease. The disease, cystic fibrosis, is found mostly in people of European heritage and Ashkenazi Jews. This may be because of the advantage of the heterozygous state with cholera and typhoid. Cholera and typhoid require the functional CFTR protein. So can you see why a person who is heterozygous for cystic fibrosis, which means he's a carrier, would probably have survived cholera and typhoid? Now, until recently, treatments were symptomatic, meaning the symptoms were treated. For example, if the person developed pneumonia, he'd be treated with antibiotics. Gene therapy is now a possibility. Gene replacement is where the defective gene is replaced with the healthy one. And then gene supplementation is where one or more copies of the healthy gene are added alongside the existing ones. As the added genes have got dominant alleles, the effects of the recessive alleles are overridden. Now remember that adding a functional gene does not remove the defective genes. It just means that the cells produce both functional and non-functional proteins at the same time. So the trait is recessive. So the presence of the correct gene will, if expressed, provide the protein for normal chloride channels even correcting only a small portion of the lung would thin the mucus enough to allow the cilia to move the mucus out. Before we have a look at how gene therapy can be applied to cystic fibrosis, let's just discuss the difference between ex vivo and in vivo. Ex vivo is when the cells are manipulated outside the body 
and then they're reintroduced. Now, this technique is good for blood-borne defects using blood cells. However, the manipulated cells only last a few weeks, so the treatment would need to be redone. Furthermore, care must be taken as some of the cells could turn cancerous depending on where the gene is inserted. This technique would not work for cystic fibrosis. The in vivo approach involves using a vector to insert the gene into the body. Now much research is going on in this technique, but gene therapy hasn't proved to be successful yet. Okay, let's have a look at two different techniques of gene therapy. You've got the germline therapy and the somatic cell therapy. Take a moment to think about what the difference is between the two. Germline therapy is when the defective gene is replaced or supplemented into the fertilized egg. This ensures that all the cells of the organism will develop uh, normally, as will all the cells of the offspring. This is therefore a much more permanent solution affecting further generations. However, more moral and ethical issues of manipulating such a long-term genetic change mean that the process is currently prohibited. Somatic cell therapy just targets the affected tissues, for example, the epithelial cells in the lungs, and the additional gene is therefore not present in the sperm or eggs, so it cannot be passed on to the next generation. As the epithelial cells in the lungs are continually dying and being replaced, the treatment needs to be repeated periodically, as often as every few days. Now at present, treatment has limited success. The long-term aim is therefore to target undifferentiated stem cells which give rise to mature tissues. The treatment would then be effective for the lifespan of the individual. The aim of somatic cell therapy is to introduce cloned normal genes into the epithelial cells of the lungs. Now one way to do this is to use viruses such as adenoviruses that cause colds and other respiratory diseases. And they inject their DNA into the epithelial cells of the lungs. They therefore make useful vectors to transfer the normal CFTR gene into the host cells. So the process works as follows. The first step is the adenoviruses are made harmless by interfering with the gene involved in their replication. These adenoviruses are then grown with epithelial cells in the laboratory, along with plasmids that have the normal CFTR gene inserted. The CFTR gene becomes incorporated into the DNA of the adenovirus. The adenoviruses are then isolated from the epithelial cells and purified. The adenoviruses are introduced to the nostrils of the patient. And then they inject their DNA with the CFTR gene into the epithelial cells of the lungs. A second mechanism is to wrap the gene in lipid molecules. The CFTR gene is inserted into a bacterial plasmid, and the bacterial plasmids are wrapped into liposomes, which are lipid spheres, which can easily cross the epithelial membrane. These are introduced into a person using a nasal aerosol spray. These forms of delivery are not always effective because adenoviruses may cause infections. Patients may develop immunity to adenoviruses. Liposome aerosols may not be fine enough to be allowed to pass through the tiny bronchioles in the lungs and the CFTR gene may not be expressed in the cells. And then lastly, we're gonna have a look at the advantages and disadvantages of using gene therapy to treat cystic fibrosis. So take a moment to think about a few advantages and a few disadvantages. Advantages would be that it treats the cause rather than the symptoms. 
It requires no physiotherapy. It requires no antibiotics. And it's less time consuming than other treatments. Disadvantages would be that the effects only last a few days. The uptake of target cells is low. It only targets lung cells. And there could be side effects. And that concludes our lesson. The end.